This Impact Wrestling Review was brought to you by 5-Hour Energy. Try it, and Angelina Love will eat several square meals immediately before she wastes away to nothing. Having so many mixed feelings about lockdown and being a little more cognizant of a number of things that TNA didn't do but should have and should have done but didn't at lockdown, after dissecting the pay-per-view with the Schlag Daddy on the OTRS podcast, for which the link is down there, I realized how important it was that TNA really deliver the goods on impact. Now, regardless of how you felt about lockdown, that pay-per-view pissed a lot of people off. They needed to hit the ground running here. And I have to say that TNA put on a pretty damn good impact this week. Man, this was a lot of fun. I haven't had so much fun watching this show in a long time. There was a different energy this week. Maybe it was because the crowd was actually awake. And where the hell were those fans on Sunday, I ask you? Not in Miami, that's for damn sure. But whatever the reason was, I like this impact. I liked it a lot. I'm really enjoying MVP as the authority figure already. He's not constantly botching his promos like Hogan. There's no overexposure factor like there was with Dixie. This feels very refreshing to me. Although, I did have a few gripes about this opening segment. Abyss. First, he was being derivative of The Undertaker at Lockdown. Now, he's being derivative of Kane by putting the mask back on, but that's neither here nor there. We really needed a great explanation for why Abyss joined up with Magnus in order for this to make sense. But apparently, the only one they had for us was Magnus paid him off. And that right there proves just what a completely random deus ex machina this whole thing was. Has Abyss ever seemed like a character that would care about money? Does that make any sense to you at all? But Seth Draken had a good thought about this on Twitter, that this could be the result of Abyss's two personalities fusing together. And that would actually make a weird kind of sense and would plug a lot of holes in this. But if all we ever get for an explanation is Magnus paid him off, then it doesn't really matter. And the second problem, why is Samoa Joe out there? Why is he wrestling? I'm sorry, but if somebody nails you in the gut with a fucking Tetsubo, you're not going to be walking around after that. You're going to be in a hospital ICU somewhere with grievous internal injuries, and that's if you're even still alive. This is why I hate Janice. You can't use a weapon like that without maiming or killing someone, but every time someone gets hit with it and they don't sell it that much afterward, you completely take the believability out. Samoa Joe should have been gone for at least a couple of weeks to sell that. Joe's guts should have been pouring out onto the mat for crying out loud. But instead, he's just clutching his stomach and that's it? That's it? I will not participate in this charade this evening. However, if you could get past that, this was a good segment in and of itself. The promos were fine. The MVP was rambling a little bit. Joe versus Abyss was fine. They set up Abyss versus Eric Young for a later day. And that's got a lot of story behind it now. I'm interested to see that one, actually. And going back to something I said before, this is the Eric Young that Eric Young needs to be. Now he's found a happy medium. He can still do the comedy stuff, but he also has a serious side to him. So when the time comes to take him seriously like you needed to do here, now you can do that. When he was just the mental patient clown who was locking up with the referee and taking his pants off all the time, there was no way a feud with him and Abyss would have worked. Now you've got a monster, you got a scrappy, likable underdog, and a good reason for them to fight. Good stuff. Let's do it. Do my eyes deceive me? Is that a new knockout in the ring? One that might actually be worth watching this time? Yeah! fucking Luya. Finally, a new matchup. A fresh matchup that I haven't seen a million times already. And just like that, 
Just like that, I have a reason to care about this knockout segment. Isn't it amazing how that works, TNA? I don't know what the hell took you so damn long to do this, but better late than never. Thank you. Now please sign like three or four more new knockouts and you'll be in business. Okay, Santana Garrett. She wasn't my number one pick, but by God, I'll take her. She looks great. She can wrestle. She's a new, fresh face that's not a former knockout or a former diva. All very good things. There is a downside, though. I've watched her stuff for a while, and I've just never seen a really confident, entertaining, engaging promo from her. So the mic skills are a big question mark. I don't necessarily think she's the most charismatic person on earth or the best interview, but she is a good wrestler. So while I hesitate to say that they have a huge star with Brittany, at the very least I think she's a good utility player to have, and I'd take her in a second over ODB at this point, I can tell you that. So she may not have been my first choice, but they could do a hell of a lot worse. In this match with her and Gail Kim, yes, she didn't get to show much of anything, I wasn't happy about that either. But that wasn't really the point. The point is, she got the win, and they started the process of getting her over, which is the most important thing first off. And hell, she got more over in this one match than Lady Tapa has in the last five months, so that's a good sign. I think the Impact Zone fans were as desperate as I was, and still am, quite frankly, to see new faces in this division. Hopefully soon we'll get a match that's more about showcasing Brittany and what she can really do, but just as a way to introduce her to the audience, I thought this was alright. So Brittany wins after Tapa's interference backfires, and then Gail and Tapa start fighting. And is it my imagination, or did this come right the fuck out of nowhere? I mean, there had been some small teases of tension between them, but it hadn't been played up at all. Not until this segment. Didn't we skip a few steps here? I mean, this breakup angle suddenly went from 0 to 60 just like that. And not in a good way, either. This seemed very, very rushed. And even though, if there's one woman on this roster that can carry Lady Tapa to a good match, it's Gail Kim, I am in no hurry to see Tapa get her own feud. No hurry whatsoever. No! 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 To any people out there who might actually like the bromance, to anyone out there who actually thinks this team is worth one single crap, to anyone who questions why I'm always pointing out what complete scrubs these schmucks are, I present to you this episode of Impact Wrestling. Tigre Uno and Sonata could have beaten anyone in their Impact debut. They could have beat Bad Influence, whose contracts are up soon and might be leaving. They could have beaten North Furnham and Dewey Barnes for crying out loud. But they didn't. Instead, TNA feeds them the bromance on a silver platter, and they made these clowns look ridiculous. And then to top it all off, after that, the bromance get punked out like bitches three-on-one by Bully Ray backstage like they're the biggest losers on Earth. <laughs> it's like I've been saying this whole time. Tag team champions or not, it makes no difference. The bromance are a complete joke. Glorified jobbers, placeholder champions, and I got news for you, TNA know it. Why else do you think they are constantly treated like this? It's not even about their wrestling at this point. I actually think Jesse Goddard's has gotten a lot better. But it's about how they're booked. Wins, losses, credible victories and lack thereof, all that stuff adds up. TNA give them just enough wins so they can avoid losing their grip on the bottom rung of the ladder, but ultimately, when it's time to get serious, what are the bromance really worth? Nothing! Absolutely nothing! You know, this was a really fun match. It was pretty short, but Tigre Uno and Sonata were awesome here. They even got Mike Tanay to sound excited, and that's no small feat these days. Great, fast-paced, high-flying action from these two. The kind of match that TNA used to deliver on a regular basis. The kind of match that used to set them apart from WWE, and the kind of match they really ought to have more of to get back some of their identity that they kind of lost over the years. More matches like this, please, TNA. And if you want to make Tigre Uno and Sonata a permanent tag team, I'd be cool with that too. I say we get these dudes into a feud with the Wolves ASAP. Yes! 
Although, leave it to TNA to not lift a finger to promote the great Muda when he was going to be wrestling at lockdown, and then show Muda in a backstage pre-tape on Impact for a show he doesn't even appear on in person. I don't get it. You people are fools! I have to say, this business of setting up Ethan Carter III versus Bobby Lashley really bothers me. And this is not the EC3 hero worship talking even though he is wrestling's greatest hero and the new American icon of wrestling, and to hell with anyone who says otherwise. This is just the fan in me talking. You sign Michael Hutter, you give him this great character, and he runs with it. He's charming, funny, charismatic, he gets over. You build him up great, from beating up jobbers to the point where he's getting victories over Sting. Yeah, regardless of how it happened, he still beat Sting, goddammit. Then you actually have him take out Kurt Angle and put him out of action. You put all this heat on EC3, and it's working. It's working. You took Derek Bateman from NXT, and you turned him into a TNA guy. You made him a star just so you could serve him up to Bobby Lashley, of all people? No! I know it hasn't happened yet, but the very idea makes me angry. If you want EC3's win streak to end, so be it. But he's been built up enough by this point that beating him would be a nice feather in the cap for somebody. So why not give it to another TNA guy, like a Gunner or a Kenny King, someone who would really benefit from it? Why give it to another former WWE guy who doesn't need it? Lashley didn't even really catch on in WWE. Hell, he didn't catch on in TNA the last time he was there either. You put him over Samoa Joe at Bound for Glory 2009 and they boot him out of that place. This is not the right feud for either guy right now, in my opinion. EC3, Bobby Lashley. And if you doubt that whatsoever, look at this Dixie Carter tribute segment. TNA, please give us more segments with EC3 and Rockstar Spud together. These guys are a riot. Spud's promo alone was hysterical, but EC3's facial expressions and the way he played off Spud without even saying anything? Priceless. And that video, that awesome video of them kissing Dixie Carter's ass with the thank you Dixie hashtag? <laughs> My sides hurt, I was laughing so hard. This stuff was fucking gold. And the heat they were getting, my god, the crowd was eating this up. I would almost put this on par with the Ego Hall of Fame. That's how freaking hilarious this was. Outstanding comedy. It was so great. I didn't want this segment to end. And then MVP brings out Bobby Lashley, who just sort of stands there with that blank look on his face. And now I'm supposed to support him after this freaking brilliant segment I just got from EC3 and Spud? Not gonna happen, TNA. Not. A. Chance. Samuel Shaw versus Ken Anderson. Why was this a street fight? It was way too short for a street fight. They didn't do a damn thing here that they couldn't do in a normal match. So why on earth make it a street fight at all? What the hell is the point? Quite frankly, after what happened at lockdown, I was not eager to see this feud continue. The match was better than what they did on Sunday, but that's not saying much. And what was the deal with the mannequin? What was that? Now Shaw is bringing the Christy Hemi mannequin out to the ring with him like it's a person? Okay, now you're crossing that fine line between genuinely creepy and just plain farcical. I mean... It, it, it seemed to get over here, but I'll be damned if I know how. Al Snow did something similar with Head back in the day, and that gimmick was played for laughs. There are certain things that are just more appropriate when they happen backstage. The mannequin was genuinely ominous in that security camera footage of Shaw's apartment, but in front of a live crowd? It's just not the same thing. Maybe if they filmed the mannequin differently, presented it differently somehow, I don't know, but... This isn't creepy, TNA. This is just absurd. Da -na -na -na. Oh, you were not aware of this? Let me get this straight. In a knockout division that is full of women who have been around for years, been the champion multiple times, and feuded with everyone there is to feud with, 
a division that is starving for new feuds, new matchups, and fresh characters, instead of taking one of the many open spots you have on your women's roster and giving it to another new girl, you bring back Angelina Love. Angelina Love, who has been on TV for years, already feuded with everyone, and been the champion more times than anyone. Why are you doing this? I first heard that Angelina might be returning from an article on Divas365.com back on February 8th. And ever since that day, for well over a month now, I've been hoping that this was not going to happen. I know Angelina was a big star for you at one point, but she has nothing new left to accomplish in this company. Nothing. Lo and behold, she's back not even two minutes, and immediately this becomes all about the fucking beautiful people. As if that gimmick hadn't been beaten to death already. And I know it was a big ratings draw at one time. Not anymore, apparently, because the viewership went down for this segment. But that's in the past. Even if you redo it now, it's never going to be as fresh or as interesting as it was back then. Thankfully, it looks like that might not happen. Her and Velvet may end up feuding instead. But guess what? We've seen that before, too. I don't want to see that feud again. It sucked the first two times they did it. Hashtag time-traveling lesbian vampire zombie and no, she is never going to live that gimmick down. That's the problem with bringing Angelina back. The fresh creative possibilities for her are so limited at this point that practically everything she does is going to be a retread. Oh, my brother! Testify! Now, as for the segment itself... This made me remember why the whole winter debacle was such bullshit. Because there were real reasons to drive a wedge between Angelina and Velvet. Reasons that would resonate with the audience, and instead they had to do all that asinine science fiction garbage. This time, the writers were smart about this. This time, there were real reasons for them not to get back together, and they played those up. Since Angelina's been gone, Velvet has had a taste of independence, been a singles champion, accomplished some things on her own. And now that Angelina wants to get the band back together, Velvet kind of feels like she's outgrown it. That makes perfect sense for her character. That was nice work by the writers there. However, this segment was a classic example of why Velvet Sky is better as a heel. And Angelina, too, for that matter. These were not bad promos, but... There was no energy between them. There was no spark. They used to have a spark when they worked together as heels, but it just wasn't here for some reason. The crowd looked livelier than they were. How ironic is that? They were acting strangely laid back, and they sounded kind of bored, actually. Something important was missing here. If one of them is going to turn heel, I hope it's soon. But even if that does happen, it's not going to be enough to make me care about this. We've been there, done that with Angelina and Velvet, and I'm sorry, but I have no desire to see it again. And that's the fishing line, cause Shark Boy said so. And oh my dear sweet God, Angelina Love desperately needs to gain some weight. It legit frightens me how skinny this woman is. Angelina, sweetie, I will personally, out of my own pocket, Pay to have a large pepperoni pizza delivered to your house if you promise me, right here, right now, that you will eat the entire thing. Seriously. Then Willow squashed Rockstar Spud. Son of a bitch. I don't even care what his wrestling is like, okay? Rockstar Spud is an awesome character, a brilliant performer, he could be a heat machine if you let him. He deserves to win a match once in a while, goddammit. Rockstar Spud is in the building! And what the hell was going on with this match? Willow gets DQ'd for using a weapon. He breaks out all this hardcore stuff. He tries to break Spud's leg with a chair. I didn't know what I was supposed to think here, but this kind of made me feel sorry for Rockstar Spud. I mean, sure, the dude's a heel, but Jesus Christ, he didn't deserve all that. Was this a heel turn for Willow? A face turn for Spud? I... I don't know. <laughs> Very confusing booking here. The Rockstar Spud has left the building. Well, if you were hoping for a real explanation for why Bully Ray turned face at lockdown, then I'm afraid I've got some bad news. 
Apparently, he turned face just for the hell of it. Maybe when Anderson put him in that cheap-ass coffin and put the fear of God in him. I don't fucking know. And to be honest, I wonder if the writers even know. I think this whole face turn was just them calling an audible and wiping the slate clean with Bully Ray because the homicidal pyromaniac version of his character was just a little too awkward. And holy shit. Where else but TNA can a guy go from trying to light people on fire to being greeted as a hero a couple of weeks later? Only in TNA, man. This fucking company sometimes. I swear. I'm not saying it makes sense. I'm not saying there aren't plot holes here. I'm saying that the previous version of Bully Ray that was feuding with Ken Anderson for the last few months was not working. More often than not, he was greeted with what chance or awkward silence. Here, he was back to being himself, and he was super over. They hit the reset button on Bully Ray. Yes, it's jarring, and it doesn't always make sense, but it's pro wrestling. Sometimes it just happens. In this case, it was a change for the better, and I can live with that. Him doing a feud with Bobby Roode now makes sense. That's fine. I loved how when he challenged Roode, Roode just jumped in the ring and didn't pull any chicken shit stuff. It's refreshing to see a heel with some balls like that. I like the promo, I like the segment. Good way to close the show. Despite some gripes, I thought the good far outweighed the bad this week. For me, this was one of the most enjoyable impacts in a long time. No joke. I had a ton of fun watching this one. Fantastic comedy, some story developments, new characters in the mix. The hot crowd helped a hell of a lot. Also, the stuff with the knockouts deserves to be pointed out because I greatly appreciated what they did this week. Finally, there's more happening in this division than just champion versus challenger in recycled match after recycled match. Look at all the stuff that's going on all of a sudden. Gale versus Tapa, Angelina and Velvet, and whatever that's going to lead to. New knockout Brittany possibly challenging Madison Rain for the title. That was teased as well, and that's a new matchup. That's three different storylines for the knockouts. Three! Sure, I didn't like all of them. Hell, I didn't like most of them. But the fact that they're even getting them in the first place is tremendous. This was the first time in a very long time that it felt like TNA wasn't just treading water with their women's division and was actually trying to make it interesting again like it used to be. I don't like some of the people they're doing it with. They've still got a long way to go and more improvements to make. But they were trying for a change. I became such a big fan of the knockouts in the beginning because attention and effort like that was put into them. And it looks like they were doing it again here. And I appreciate that, TNA. I really do. Keep it up. This was a really good impact. One of the most enjoyable in a long time. After lockdown, they really needed to deliver a great TV show here. And hot damn, they pulled it off. If this is what we can expect from the MVP era, then I guess I'm optimistic about it. <laughs> See you next week. Over. Out. Out.